welcome. Good to, good to quote unquote see all of you, all several pages of you here. Glad that you could be here. Of all the things you could be doing on a, on a Tuesday evening, tuning in to this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm honored. Hopefully uh, it'll be, I think it will be, and I believe it will be worth, worth an hour of your time. So thank you so much um, as we have this first of our pre-convention workshops. And I think we should start with a, a prayer and we'll do so now. And the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, source of all wisdom and truth and understanding, be with us as we take counsel and sit in discernment for the future of your church and your world. Give us eyes to see what is around us. Give us courage to discuss the undiscussable and give us courage to see the future and to live into it. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be first up in the lineup of convention workshops, you know, every Tuesday night for the next, for, for th the upcoming three weeks, um, we'll be having presentations. Next week's my colleague, Kathleen Moore. You won't want to miss that. Um, she'll do a great job talking about communications. And um, if ever there was anybody that understood that, it, it's her. So if you, if, if you can clear off next Tuesday evening, uh, come back. If I don't scare you off with my presentation tonight, and I'm hoping that that, that doesn't happen. So what we're going to do this evening is um, I'm going to, to spend some time talking about uh, a framework of, of adaptive leadership and uh, ad adaptive work. And this may be new to some of you. So some of you, this may be old hat. Um, what I want to do, though, is, is talk about how we frame this in relationship to the church. And the first thing that I want to do is begin with a, um, a, uh, a bit of um, Bible study. Just briefly, I'd, I'd like to have us take a look at uh, a, a passage of scripture and I'm gonna put it in the chat. And um, you can find the chat feature by taking your arrow down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and you see a thing that says chat there. And if you, if, you, um, if you click on that, you'll be able to, the, the chat feature should show up on the side of the screen. And if you can't get that to work, don't worry, I'm going to read it to you anyway. But this is a place that I thought we would, would start this evening. We're going to have some small group discussion and some others, but I guarantee you we won't be keeping you here all night, so uh, worry not. So here we start with the eighth chapter of Mark. And... Um, I'm going to, to read it in Greek as you read it in English. Okay, I just wanted to see if everybody was, was still with me. Uh, we're gonna, I think we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna stick with English. All right, here we go. So this is from Mark chapter eight. This is an important story. I think it begins to illustrate what, what being adaptive can look like and, and some of the principles of it. So they came to Bethsaida, that's the disciples. They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Now, I love this story, not at least which is because it, things don't happen immediately. And I'm a person that likes things to happen immediately. I mean, I expect if I take somebody who's blind or I myself am blind and I, ha and I have been in multiple ways spiritually over the course of my lifetime, when I go to Jesus, I expect to be touched and healed. I don't know about you, but I like instant results. The faster, the better. Um, patience is not a spiritual gift, according to the scripture. It's a fruit of the spirit, which means you have to be taught patience. You, you can't just pray for it and get it, which is why I don't pray for it, because I don't want to be taught patience, and I don't, I don't have a lot of it. And, and most, of us, most of us really, when it comes to spiritual things, we often don't. I mean, I think it takes us getting into a, a particular place of spiritual maturity to get there, and some of you are, and I'm, I'm working on it. But they expect you, but the, interestingly, what Jesus does is this, this blind man's in the village 
interesting thing that happens first is that Jesus leads him out of the village. Which I find a fascinating move. And I think as we talk about adaptive leadership, I think some of thinking about our adaptive problems, and you, you, now you've heard me say this word like 10 times and I haven't explained to you what I even mean, but I will in a minute. I just want you to have this pericope, this piece of scripture in mind as we, as we go there. They go out of the village. I don't know what Jesus was, well, I don't know what was really happening, but I might imagine that this man could not be healed of his blindness in that village. I'm imagining that for whatever reason, that was not the space it could happen. And even when they got outside the village, I think he had to probably get away from the villagers saying, this is your lot to be blind. You're supposed to be, this is the way you're supposed to be. This is, this is the way God must have meant you to be. My guess is that he's been told his whole life, it's okay, he's that way. Um, that's the way God made him. And, and he doesn't want to be that way though. And he's asking Jesus to change that. And I'm, I'm guessing that the village isn't the context where that can happen. And I imagine all of us have had times in our life where we'd like things to be different. We know if we stay where they are, they're not going to be. We're gonna have to go somewhere else to, to, to figure out how they're different. That's what I imagine happening here. And his sight is not restored the first time that Jesus touches him. He has to ask Jesus to touch him again. And I imagine that he could have asked Jesus to touch him many times before he was healed. And that is, that's, that is always, as I see it, one of our calls to Jesus, um, that we receive Jesus and the healing touch of God over and over and over again in our lives. Very, very rarely are things just fixed the first time. Although it's going to be one of my first questions of God, if I have the opportunity. So let's, let's take a look. I'm having, having that in mind. I'll, I'll talk about how that, that comes up in a minute, but I, what I want to do is um, take you now to, um, to have, take a look at some, some slides that I have and, and talk about those. And I assume those are up in front of you and that you can see them now. And start by saying normal is our history, not our future. I think I would have said this uh, two years ago. I might've said this a while ago. I might've at least thought it, but I boy, particularly in light of this global pandemic, I think it's the, it's, it's the case. What I wanna talk about is um, the fact that I, well, that I believe that there is hope. I, am a, I will tell you up front, I'm a prisoner of hope. And I, I live in hope that God wants more for this church than we could ask or imagine, and that God wants more for us and more for the transformation of the world. So I'm a person filled with hope. And I also think that in order to adequately engage in hope, we have to, and, and the reality of hope, we have to face the current reality and, and of where we are. And we don't, need to, we don't need to blame ourselves. We just need to begin to think differently. And that's what I'm hoping to introduce tonight to, to some of you and maybe take you deeper in it for others. And what I want to do is talk to you about a framework uh, that takes problems and issues that we face and looks at them with a certain lens. And I want to introduce you to that lens. The lens is the lens of the technical and the adaptive. This is, a, this is a lens that we're beginning to use um, in, the, in the church more and more in our thinking. It's one way to look at issues. It is by no means the only way. It is one process and by no means the only one. But it's a, it's a good tool and I think it's particularly helpful for us in this time in the church, particularly as we struggle to figure out what's next for us. So let me start by saying, I sometimes will call them technical problems. I sometimes call them type one problems. And the reason I do that, I'll talk a bit more about later. And that's because technical and adaptive have become words like you may remember back in the day when we used to talk about mission and maintenance. You were either mission minded or maintenance minded. And, and that got to be where you didn't want to be maintenance minded. You only wanted to be mission minded, except uh, I got to tell you, if the roof's leaking and the infrastructure isn't there, you're not going to have, you can't be very mission oriented. So both are important. So I sometimes say type one, type two, and type three problems to take the, take the emotional valence off them. But let's start with what they are. Say we've got a type one issue. This is an issue where the problem definition is very clear. 
we know what the problem is, the solution definition is very clear. And the focus of the work is typically authority. In this, in this structure, we think about leadership and authority separately. We say authority is something that provides us direction, protection, and, and order, direction, protection, and control. So this is, you're looking to the expert. For example, here's a good example of a technical problem. The roof is leaking in the church, in the parish hall, okay? What do you do? Fix the leak. I mean, the fact is there's, a, there's water coming into the church. We know that there's a way to fix that. And probably we can, we can get up and see what the issue is. If nothing else, a solution definition is clear, and that is there is a leak in the roof and the leak needs fixed. And we can call a roofer, or many of you who have had served your life sentence as junior wardens will go to the shed or the basement of the church and get up the ladder and climb up and fix the leak. This is, this is a classic technical problem. Even something very complicated can be a technical problem. Heart bypass surgery, for example, would be considered very technical. Yes, it takes high skill. Yes, it's complex. Yes, it takes years of training to do, but it's primarily technical. There's a problem, we know what the solution is, and there is somebody that can fix it. These are the problems that I enjoy most. Uh, these are the problems where I feel like I've got the expertise to fix. You call the diocesan office and we know exactly what to do and that happens about once a year, right? <laughs> These where well, the problem is that clear to us. I'm going to skip over this mixed type and move to the adaptive problem. We're going to come back to that middle column in a minute or that middle row in a minute. The adaptive problem is, is where the problem definition requires learning. Okay, so it's not clear to us. We see that there's a problem, but we can't tell if that's a symptom of something or what's really going on. Example in the church, um, I hear this all the time. All of you are gonna, all of you are gonna nod, or I'm gonna know that you're you're you're, you're tuned out. But we want more young people. Where are all of our young people? All of our every time we look around our church, it's aging, and I don't see any of our children around. This is not an easy problem to fix, is it? The solution, the solution actually requires learning. So we don't have, we don't see any use. So we come up with all of these ideas that we think we can to fix it as if it was a technical problem. Look up here, you know, we think the solution definition is clear, but interestingly, everything we try um, has marginal results. We can't figure out how to make it work. Or we look around and say, our Sunday attendance isn't, isn't what it was. Why aren't people coming to church? I mean, and then everybody immediately goes to soccer on Sunday as though that somehow has done us all in um, or whatever. If it was that simple, if we knew what the solution was, I guarantee you most of us would have done it already. We'd be well along to fixing the problem, whatever it is. But the, pro the solution requires learning. And here's the key. The focus of work is the stakeholders, not the authority. The stakeholders, which means everybody in the organization has to own the problem. These are what we, we call adaptive problems. Back in the day in urban planning um, and housing, we called them wicked problems. These were problems that were are you know, really complex and difficult to solve, but where the very definition eludes us. Uh, the, the very uh, solution, we have no clue, and where the focus of work is everybody. And then I, there's, a, there's a type in here, and this is not from the framework. This is something that, that um, other, other consultants have come up with over the years and that I've sort of adapted. Um, and that's to say that I think there are problems that are both. Uh, where the solution definition requires learning. The problem is clear, the solution definition requires learning, and it takes authority and stakeholders. But many of the issues we care about in the church right now that we're, that we're focused on, that we're giving considerable time to, are adaptive issues. These are the, these are the ones that dog us constantly. We can't quite figure out how to get our hands around them or 
or, or to, to solve them because we don't even really know what the problem is. And I think that's where we are in terms of our life in general as a church right now. We sort of wish things were different. They're not the same as they used to be. and We don't exactly know what to do. Oh, that's fine. We'll learn. There are adaptive approaches that can be taken, but it first requires saying we cannot fix this problem. And here's the biggest mistake. Politicians do this all the time. It's their, favorite, uh, it's their favorite pastime. And that is mistaking what is an adaptive problem as a technical one. Treating a problem that is complex, that requires learning and that requires taking ownership of the whole group, mistaking that um, for something that is technical and be, can be fixed easily. The, the, the best example I can come up with politically is healthcare. Um, what a mess that is. And I, it doesn't matter what you think about that or what your philosophy uh, about how it should be resolved is. The fact of the matter is it is a, an adaptive problem. And you've got what constantly have politicians will say, oh, we can fix this by doing this, 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 and this. And then they get in and they realize the problem isn't that simple. In the church, we sometimes will come up with, uh, you know, five-step solutions to something. You know, how do you get five families fast in your church? Well, you don't. That's the point. If, if we knew how to get five families fast and run, and run an operation that way, we treat it like a technical problem, and we wouldn't have the issues that we currently have. I think stewardship in our, in our day and age, you know, is, is considering the, the congregational level is, a, is an adaptive issue. Uh, people are giving, giving with different patterns, and we have to learn how to communicate with those. So how do we know when we have them? Let me give you some markers that helps you say, oh, I think we might have a, an adaptive problem here that we have to take a look at. So here's some ways that you can, can identify. First, when there's a gap between espoused values and behavior. This is, this is when we say that we believe something and that we really want something, but we, ha we behave you know, in, in quite a different way. I, I think that one of the issues that we often say is that we wish, for example, one of the issues that we're working on in our diocese is to have a more diverse diocese, culturally, racially, and otherwise. So even socioeconomically, we would, would like more diversity in our congregations, and yet, we do, and yet our behavior belies a lack of understanding about how complicated that issue really is. We will say things like, we, we want people to collaborate. We want people to share resources. We want people to work together. And then we highlight uh, the large organization as doing something all by itself. We say we want leaders to work together. We want people to collaborate and then we individually recognize people for quote unquote their accomplishments. We often see a gap between espoused values and behavior, not because people um, are, have malintent, but just because um, we don't quite know how to align our behavior with what we say we want. And sometimes we think we are and we are. And often that's because it was requiring new learning of us. And because what we did before actually works for us. And this is where, this was what often makes it hard to change because what we're doing now in many ways works for us, or at least we like it. Competing commitments. We, well, we all face this in our organizations that we work with. Oh, we'd like to have, we'd like to have, for example, in our church, we'd like to have, um, more mission, more outreach to the community. We'd like to serve the people around us, yet we have to cut the budget. Um, so we, or we have to be financially responsible. So we have these competing commitments and we can see in our competing commitments, we've got issues that we're not sure or how to resolve. This one I think is particularly important for Episcopalians uh, and, and our church and, and, and the society as a whole, many of our other organizations, we're talking about the church here, and that is discussing the undiscussable. Discussing the undiscussable. 
there are lots of things that we know we need to talk about, but we really can't. We can't figure out how to do it. Um, as I was really um, coming of age in the church and uh, new early in my vocation, the issue facing the Episcopal Church uh, at the time was a uh, full inclusion of LGBTQ plus persons in the life of the church. So talking about sexuality, Episcopalians were not particularly uh, fond of the idea about talking about these issues. These were issues that one was to, to, be, to these were issues to be kept private. These weren't issues to be discussed openly in public. So therefore we didn't have a really good map, a really good way to come to the table and have an honest conversation about it. Same is true in our world today about the issue of race and race justice. These are issues we'd like to talk about, but we're not exactly sure how. These are issues that we'd like to raise, but we're worried about how to talk about them, what to say, how to behave, um, particularly in light of the fact that we're in a, in a pretty unforgiving and graceless world, people are even less likely to bring up the things that are undiscussable. Maybe back uh, when, when you were growing up or whatever, it was politics and religion at the dinner table. I don't know, whatever it was, there's always the undiscussable in the room, the thing that you know you, you would like to bring to the table, but you can't. Have you ever been having a discussion at a vestry meeting and you know something needs to be said, but nobody really wants to say it? Discussing the undiscussable in the church is, is critical. And I think many of our adaptive issues come to the table as we, as we begin to discuss them and as we begin to have the courage to put them out on the table. And then, and the fourth one is avoidance of work. Do I mean, by, I do not mean by this being lazy. I don't mean that we don't want to do the work. It just means that we'd like to pass it off. Now we have a joke, right, in the church that uh, we like to create committees and task forces to do things, but it's a classic work avoidance technique. And let me give you an example of this. About, well, it's, it's been seven or eight years ago, it's hard to believe. That the General Convention authorized a group of people to reimagine the Episcopal Church. And I, I was on that, that group of people. So there were like 25 of us charged by the whole General Convention. It was a unanimous vote. Go and reimagine re the Episcopal Church and its structure and the way it does business and bring us back recommendations, bring us back a package. So I, I tell you, I spent with, with all of these folks, we spent three years of our lives that we can never get back. Brought all this back to the General Convention and they essentially adopted none of it. So. I always joke that it was the task force that didn't reimagine anything. And I think it wasn't bad intention on anyone's part. I actually, I don't take it personally. I'm, you know, I, it is, those, those things happen, right? And we've all seen it happen in our churches where we've, we've set up a committee to go do something in our diocese where we've gone out to do something, we come back and nothing, nothing really changes. I think what happened in that case, and we didn't know it at the time, we weren't, we weren't aware, again, not malintent, but the church was avoiding taking on responsibility for its own work. It gave it to a group of people to relieve the anxiety to try to resolve the issue quickly. But the fact of the matter is we didn't have a good problem definition and we really had no idea how to fix it and no one was really invested in the outcome. This, this becomes, this becomes the, uh, the, an, an issue um, as, we, as we consider how we work through what is an adaptive issue. So let me back up to the, to the adaptive, um, my adaptive chart here and um, just highlight a, 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 few, a few other issues. Just to, and just to recap, and then I'll take a few questions and then we're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll try a bit of, a, of, of an exercise here. The type one technical problem is it can be very complex. It does not mean that it's easy. It just means we know what to do. You break a bone, you know what, that, you know what to do. Worst case scenario, you've got to go to the orthopedic surgeon and, and they can put pins in or whatever it is that they do, but it can be fixed. That's the technical problem. And it could be, it could be a, a roof, like a, a fire, a, a church fire, you know, all, any, anything that we know how, to, how to, to, to fix. Then there are the adaptive issues that require learning and about the solution and the problem and where the focus of work has to be the whole organization. 
So if we as a diocese decide we're going to take on the issue of race justice, we're going to take on the matter of evangelism, of church growth, whatever it is that's, that's sort of keeping us up at night, the things that are important to us that matter, that we just can't seem to get our hands around. And the more that we do that, just the problems continue to recycle themselves. It's probably a sign to us that we're treating an adaptive problem like a technical one. Good news. If we understand it to be adaptive and we start treating it that way, we can move into a different space and we can address the adaptive problem. And that is when we begin to see the adaptive problem, our adaptive interventions, and when I say intervention, I mean an experiment, something we try as an iterative process. Now, the, the staff I work with uh, in our diocesan partnership actually forbid me from using the word iterative uh, in the office anymore. I'm not allowed to say the word iterative, so I'm going to say as many times as I can in this presentation to get it out of my system so that um, I don't get my mouth uh, washed out with soap by the, by the people around me. Um, iterative means that we are continuing to change what we're doing. We're, we're trying one thing, and then we're doing something new, and the second thing we do is an iteration. So we, we, we do it one way first, then we've, we, we improve on it and try it again. That's a second iteration. We improve on it and try it again. And that's a third iteration. And we continue to do that until we, until we begin to address our issue. And an iterative process looks like this. We begin with observing what's around us, making sure that we can see clearly what's in front of us. This can be harder than it looks. Um, sometimes it requires leaving the village. All right, and sometimes it means, get, it means getting perspective. Sometimes that means getting away from the typical ideas. Then we interpret, and this is where we often get it wrong. And it's not through any fault of our own necessarily, except we can get in our own way. I don't know about you, but I like to interpret things uh, in ways that favor my own thinking. I mean, I'm sure you don't do that, um, but I occasionally will interpret something to, so that it works with what I, kind of an idea that I have or a bias that I have. And, you know, you've heard the old thing, you know, every, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, you know, it, it's, it's easy for all of us to do, but we, in, we have to interpret what's around us. Then we decide we're going to intervene. So we're going to engage a program. We're going to change a behavior. We're going to implement a new set of policies. Whatever it is, we're going to try this. Here's where the church gets stuck, though. This happens to us all the time. It's, our, it's, it's one of our favorite things to do. We try something, and then when it doesn't work, we do one of two things. We either double down on it, like as if the gospel message was try harder, okay? Or we continue to say forever, um, that's, we've never done it that. We, we did that, we tried that before, <laughs> okay? We tried that before and that didn't work. So we're not doing it again. Our diocesan partnership, I would say, is a good example of an iterative process. We observed the context around us, that is the church is changing. We interpreted that in a particular way to say, we really need to do something. Maybe we partner together, maybe we can collaborate. We got a group together to talk about all these things and we weren't sure whether we wanted to do it or not. But then we decided the intervention was a, a five-year partnership. And of course, you know, people were saying, I don't know what I think about that. I don't know whether we should do that. But here's the thing. Guess what we do at the end of five years if it doesn't work? Do something else. That's, the, that's thinking of it in an iterative process saying, well, once we do this part, you know, we're never going to be able to go back. What do you mean? Yes, we can. we can. But likely what we're doing now isn't what we'll be doing next. And if you go into your adaptive issues saying to yourself, what I'm doing now is unlikely to be what I'm doing uh, after, after we try something. We're just going to keep observing, interpreting, and intervening. It takes the fear of failure out and says, you know, let's, let's um, as they say in Silicon Valley, let's fail fast. In other words, let's figure out what we're going to do, try it, intervene, and then, and I'll say it one more time because I love to say it, then we will reiterate. 
That's the beauty of the adaptive. But it's, it's keeping in mind, I can't solve this problem with one intervention. I cannot take the decline in the Episcopal Church in our region and solve it simply by collaborating with another diocese. That can be a first intervention, but I need a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a 20th, a 100th iteration, and that is with all adaptive issues that we face. Race justice. I mean, imagine if we quickly began to intervene and try and try again and observe, interpret, and intervene. I mean, the whole movement has been doing that for a very long time. But I mean, in our efforts in the church, you know, in our part of the world, what if we got serious about continuing to try to do this and we lined up our values and behaviors? What I'd like for us to do is to think about the adaptive issues that we face. And I'd, I'd like you to think about using two frames. The first is the gap between espoused values and behavior. And, this, and the third being discussing the undiscussable. So what, what we're gonna do here shortly, um, yeah, we're, we're gonna break out into groups on Zoom for about 10 minutes and then we're gonna come back. I promise you won't have to do this forever. I'd like to break you into groups and, and in your own context, in your congregational context, I'd like you to talk about two things. What are the undiscussables? that you think represent possible adaptive issues in your context? What are, the, what are some of the undiscussables? And what are some of the gaps between espoused values and behaviors that you see? So those two things, gaps between espoused values and behaviors, and, and what are some of the undiscussables in, in your context? But first, I'd like to take just a few minutes here to see if there are any questions you have or anything you'd like me to clarify before we do that. Any thoughts, questions, anything, anything interesting, anything you, you find particularly challenging or problematic? Bishop? Yes. Yeah, it's hey. Judy. Yeah, Judy. I wanna, I wanna know if we're gonna look at this um, in what used to be our normal world or in this COVID-19 world, which has affected our churches and our congregations and ourselves and our families and our lives and everything is just such a um, mixed up mess. Yeah, you bet it is. I think both, Judy. Um, I, you know, in terms of our small groups, I think both. And in terms, boy, talk about an adaptive issue. Um, this, this pandemic is, you I mean, you, you raise the, the big one. I mean, we, we don't even know what the problem is yet. We don't even understand this virus, uh, let alone what the effects of it are going to be. And, and so we're constantly adapting. I think both, Judy. I think okay. keep both in mind. Thank you. Okay. And happy birthday to Spencer. Oh, thank you. I'll tell him. Okay. <laughs> Anything? Any? I'm going to suggest we, we break out into groups and, and you'll get a box on your screen that'll tell you to go into a group and you just click on that and then it will bring you back in automatically too. So um, uh, that'll happen here momentarily. All right, everyone, welcome back. Now this is, um, now the, everybody's picture is in a new place. I feel like I'm on that, in that Sunday where everybody just decides they're going to sit in a different pew just to mess with the preacher. Sure. Um, that's just what's happened. Uh, so, I'm still um, the same. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, good. I'm glad you haven't, not, that you, you haven't changed, but goodness gracious. It cost all me right. 20 bucks, but I did it. <laughs> all right. All right. So thanks. So I'm curious, any, anybody just want to sort of chime in on anything that, anything that if you had a, a particular issues or issue that, that, that came up? Uh, in your group that you think is worth, worth sharing with us all, not, not you know, don't want a huge explanation, just kind of naming the, some of the topics. In our group, we talked about the political situation. Um, we talked about the pandemic itself. Um, any, any other, any, any thoughts? Sure? Or any, yeah. Well, one topic, it came up right towards the end that we didn't really get a chance to unpack a lot was the issue of, um, the things we talk about, but we don't really follow up on. And that was, um, you know, getting Sunday schools ready. We talk, we need a Sunday school. We need to put things together. We need to go out and, 
And I can't tell you how many times I've bought curriculum, had people lined up, and you know the parents say, I'll bring the kids, and then you don't see them for six months and nobody shows up. Um, you know, we espouse, we wanna have Sunday school for the kids, but then when we do it, they, the parents don't bring the kids sometimes, and, it, and it's frustrating. That was one issue that we talked a little bit about. Yeah. I mean, there's a great one. I mean, let's talk about Sunday school. Um, you know, I, I came up in the, the 80s and 90s. I mean, I was like, the, you remember the 80s youth group and the, you know, the, the, everybody taught, yeah, that, I, I did all that. I love, that's one of the reasons I'm here. I did all that stuff. And I went to Sunday school every week and there were 20 kids in my son, the whole nine yards, except now people don't do that. There is an adaptive problem for us. Christian education, adaptive. And we come up with all kinds of technical things. Like we're going to buy a new curriculum. We're going to change the time of Sunday school. We're going to do the same thing we did in the morning, except do it in the afternoon. No, we're going to do the same thing we did on Sunday mornings on Wednesday night. No, we're going to do the same. But the, I think the problem actually doesn't have a clear definition. And we don't know exactly what the problem is. The problem that people don't bring their kids to church or is that, or is there, is the problem different? I, I submit the matter. That's a great one to bring up. Uh, Dave, because I believe that the matter of Christian education and formation on Sundays is, a, is an adaptive issue that the church has not adequately addressed and treats it as technical. And um, that's because we don't have the patience to, to, to I think, in many, and sometimes dig deeply. Not that we haven't tried hard. I don't mean that. I just mean that it might be worth reframing how we look at the problem. Anything else? Any others that, that came up? Sir? I would like to share. Yeah. Sure. Brian Reed. Yes, Brian. Um, two things. One, just to comment that Sunday schools have only been around for 200 years and were an ad adaptation for kids who were working in the mines so that they could actually learn to read and write and be able to read scripture. Um, so it's time for us to do a new adaptation in terms of educating all the people of the church. The second thing is sometimes we try new things and in our evaluation, if it didn't do what we wanted, we change the terms of the evaluation <laughs> and say, but it was good fellowship. <laughs> even though we set out to bring in more people. That's a third possibility for you. Anyway, that's it. I have a question, Bishop. Yeah. Matt, like in here, um, and, and it's ringing another change on the Sunday school question because, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's a vexing thing that all of us are struggling with. But I wonder if Sunday school and what Brian Reed said just now is really interesting to me. I wonder if Sunday school itself was a technical fix to a problem in its day. And it isn't just that we don't have the right technical fix for Sunday school, but we're not addressing a different problem entirely. And Sunday school isn't the solution. Uh, yes. And if you frame it, if you use the adaptive framework and you treat, if you treat what you're looking at as the Sunday school, I mean, that's your presenting issue. Okay. That's your symptom. And you treat it as adaptive, you get to exactly what you're saying. I mean, it opens up the possibility that what you're saying is actually the case, Matt, that that's not really the issue. But if, if you treat it as a problem, a technical problem to be fixed, you can't get there. I think you just, you just did, you just de demonstrated the point of this workshop. So I, we could stop now. Um, <laughs> and I was, I should, I should, you know, the, the cell has been made. Yeah, take a bow. Um, that's the point. That is the point. That is, you, you recognize that it could be something else, even. So nicely done, Matt. I, uh, thank you. But the uh, adaptive question is, why is Sunday school important? I mean, why are we doing it? Is it so we have a Sunday school? Well, so what? What's, it, what's its purpose? That's the adaptive question. The technical question is, how do we have a Sunday school? But the yeah, adaptive, I think question, the adaptive is, question is, why do we have it? Sorry. Yeah, I think the adaptive question isn't, 
what's the purpose of Sunday school? I think the adaptive question is, how do we provide Christian formation for children in 2020? And, and, and there, doesn't, that come, doesn't that come through what, what parents, how parents act and what parents do? I mean, isn't that, I mean, don't you demonstrate that to your kids if you're, if you're taking them to church? Uh, you know, our children were always with us in church and became acolytes and were active and one ran the youth group for years, actually at Trinity Church, Matt. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's always all about Sunday school. I think sometimes it's frankly how the family deals with stuff. We have always said grace. We have always said intercessory prayers in the evening before dinner. I think that's how, how you actually, how your children come into the faith. I have two kids who are not coming to church and they're adults. Uh, one of them, it's a long story, but the other one, even though they're not coming to church, they're still saying prayers and, and grace every single night at dinner. And that has not left. So, you know, I think it's it's maybe how we do it, how we do it in families. Maybe it's the families we need to be working on, not necessarily the kids. I think there's another issue too that we have to look at as as educators, and that's my job. I'm a I'm a college professor. There's there's the issue of transference of knowledge and other or information. And sometimes it's very factual kinds of things. So I'm just thinking like, you know, how do you teach the kids the catechism? You know, the and get that done. And a lot of parents were very anxious about making sure that kids know the catechism or at least been exposed to it. But I think what you're talking about is, is a Christian life. And that's done by modeling and exer you know, examples of behavior and so forth. So I think when we start thinking about if it's Christian education, are we talking about the transference of, of theology? You know, teaching them the theology? Is it about teaching them, you know, how to behave as Christians and what Christians do? Is it teaching moral lessons, ethical, ethical um, ideas, and so forth? So I think if we define what it is we're trying to get the kids to learn, um, then it might have to start looking at the, you know, sort of the mechanisms of that, the fixes, um, the technical issues, as the bishop was saying. Somebody just put up in the chat, uh, Lisa just put up in the chat, you know, why is the church no longer relevant to people? Well, this would be, this would be getting at, you know, kind of um, uh, getting at the adaptive. What, what, is, what is going on here and what behaviors and new things do we need to learn? Not so much to make it more relevant, but to connect. I think that, that the church, it's possible the church could be more relevant now than ever, but we have no way of connecting. I like to, you know, some of, one of the images I like to use, which, you know, breaks down at a certain point, but I always feel like, you know, we've got the iPhone and the Samsung Galaxy, you know, two of the best uh, devices on the market. We can't, we can't sell it. We have just no means of connecting people to this incredible thing that we have. That's what sometimes Mr. Mr. And it's adaptive. Yeah. Mr. Oh, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Um, I, the reason I was thinking that is because some of the most, really the most moral people in my life, in my opinion, are people who also reject coming to uh, church. They're very good people. And so when we sit down and have conversations sometimes, like my nephew and I, and he used to bristle when I would try to frame something in a, in a religious quote unquote way. And so now, now I try to talk to him about my values and I try to tie in, this is why my faith tells me this. And then I, you know, I just try to always say to him, you know, you're, 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 both, you're acting faithfully, whether you know it or not. And it's <laughs> God, God doesn't care if you call it that or not, but I believe you are. And then he doesn't get so angry or, you know, not angry, but, you know, resistant. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think I, I have, I'm in, I'm in the same boat. A lot of, a lot of people that I, I respect, admire, and think are, are, are wise people, you know, sort of reject, reject faith um, as a, as a way of approaching the world, but it's a, it's a very, very good one. Bishop, um, I think yeah. one of the things that we all grew up in is across the board on everybody on your street had a faith. They, they went to some form of church, but now you fast forward 30, 40 years, we're living with a group of people where the base isn't there. So we're trying to bring church to a group that may have never known it. So we have to adapt 
to how we do that. Everything's fast paced, everything's electronic, everything is, is different than it was, where before they always had that base. And now they they are being raised by parents that don't always believe in that or follow through on that. So we're almost behind the eight ball trying to bring more youth in. Before you had the choice that when you grew older, you made the choice. Now they're growing up without the choice and we're trying to give them an opportunity that's not there. I think in a lot of places, in a lot of places where many of us grew up, that's true. Uh, and still in others, it's as secular as ever. So I think, I think you raise a good point there. I wonder if this, all this with, you know, not going to church and all that, came to effect when a lot of places got rid of one of those, what used to be called blue laws, where everything was closed on Sundays. So you had family, you had church, and that's all you did on Sunday. So I don't know if that had any issues to sure. why, why people don't go anymore because they're working. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think all of those are contributing factors. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, we, it's easy to fall into the trap that back in the day, I mean, even when I served on a school board, um, we still weren't having activities on Wednesday night, for example. I think I was on the board when that changed. You know, that's, it's been 20 years now almost. But um, so, yeah, those things have changed, except it was when you get into the mindset, though, that if we had all of that back, somehow we could, we could modify people's behavior. I don't think so. I think that contributed to the decline, but that's not really, I, I, I think now it's, it's for us to, to look differently at the enterprise and not say, how could we have what was, I know you weren't suggesting that Lisa, uh, but, but how do we, how we have what was, but how do we go to what's going to be? And the hard part about now is we simply don't know what's next. We simply don't know. And it's, it's on us now to, to work on this and figure it out. And that can be really tricky. I want to move us now as we, as we, as we come near the end of our, our time together to talk about what is referred to in this work as the, um, this is another lovely thing to say to impress your, your friends at the next party, um, the productive zone of disequilibrium. If people ask you, you know, how you're going to solve this issue, you could say, well, you know, what I'd like to do is if we got into the productive zone of disequilibrium, we could really get this worked out. <laughs> the productive zone of disequilibrium, interesting way to, to think. And what that means is that if you look at this, and I think you can see my, my cursor on the screen, if you look in this like shaded uh, gray area here between the dotted lines, that's the productive zone of disequilibrium. This is the place where you can begin to think about the change, particularly adaptive change, where you can, you can work the problem. That you may even get to the place, if you stay with it long enough, you get to where Matt took us with the issue of, of education and formation. So let's start with, if you look down and you see this thing, technical problem. If you follow that, that line back up to the top, a technical problem starts with a high level of disequilibrium and resolves, whoops, and resolves relatively quickly. Okay, so it, it starts, so let's just say we have the, 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 the church is on fire or there's a leak in the roof or, you know, we have something that, that, that's, even we, we break a bone, whatever it is, there's, it starts with a high level of these, like all of a sudden we're taken off balance uh, maybe we get treatment for it or the fire department comes or whatever it is, uh, we, but you know, whatever, whatever problem it is that you're thinking of that's technical and it gets solved. I mean, it, it comes quickly through this productive zone and resolves because it is a technical problem that can be resolved. So it's just, it's a, it's a pretty clear trajectory. Take on the other hand, the adaptive problem. This problem starts in this kind of lower left corner and comes up and what often has to happen with an adaptive issue is that you have to raise the anxiety of the group or it does it, it happens on its own because the problem continues to build and goes across this first dotted line, which is the threshold of change. Beneath this, nothing really changes. People can sort of live with the level of disequilibrium that exists below this line. Once you get above the line, that's when you're talking about, you, you're at least gonna examine change. The goal then is to, as leader, as all as stakeholders, is to 
to keep the environment in such a way that we keep the change productive. And, and so there's a threshold of change at the lower dotted line. Take the top dotted line and we'll call that the limit of tolerance. You know, there's a point at which you can only take so much. You know, people wanna make change too quickly. We've all, we've all either done that or experienced that in an organization. We've either, it's either been done to us. You know, have you ever had change done to you? Um, that's, there's nothing more maddening. Um, or where you just say this is too much. So it's an art form, right? We, 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 do, we make a lot of change, but we know there's a, there is a limit to this, right, in, in a particular season. There are ways to short circuit this. So we're moving along, treating it as an adaptive problem. And all of a sudden we get tired of the conflict, not necessarily the negative conflict interpersonally, but the conflict in us. We're, we're tired of dealing with this. So we just want it to, to resolve itself. Um, and this is, I think, what happened with the church with the reimagining. Uh, we just... D d nothing works the same way it did. Nothing looks the way that it did before. We've got to get this resolved. And the way that we're going to get this resolved is we're going to appoint a task for us and they're going to go do the work for us. Now, nobody, I voted for this thing and I was an advocate for it and I got up and, and championed this cause. So look, I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I'm just using it as an example in retrospect. So we, we, so we got it to happen and the whole church said, like, go do it, go do it and bring it back really what it turned out to be, and I can, I can only know this sometimes in retrospect, is that it was work avoidance. It was, it was there was no way for the, the group was not ready at that point to take responsibility for what had to happen. In other words, no one was really willing to make the hard decisions, to make the trade-offs that had to be made. Not because of bad leadership, not because of poor vision. I mean to imply none of that. I just mean that at the time, the organization was in such a place that couldn't happen. So they pointed the task force, they went off and did it, brought the stuff back, and essentially it short-circuited the work. It said to the whole, the whole group of stakeholders, you don't have to do this work anymore. Somebody else is going to do it. And then you can sit back and judge. You can just sit back and say, no, I don't want that. No, 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 no. I want half of the people want this, half of the people want this. That means we get nothing. Another thing in the church we love to do. Um, actually don't make a decision because this group wants this, this group wants this, so we actually don't do anything. Or we come up with a, a, a middle ground solution that makes nobody happy and takes us nowhere. This is the work avoidance. But if we can stay in that productive zone of disequilibrium long enough, in other words, live with the discomfort, live with the challenge long enough, to treat it as adaptive, we come out the other side with new learning and new processes to address the issue, understanding that, we, that, that, is a, that the process is, I'll say it one last time and I won't say it again, is iterative. It's the problems that continue to recycle themselves that over and over again, we intervene, 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 and they, they, never, they never solve, that we know we've got an adaptive issue on our hands. I believe that the church has many right now and that we can, and as a partnership, we already have taken a, making a, a ma massive adaptive move by coming into partnership with each other. Already, economically, we, we're gonna be able to um, survive this, this COVID challenge. People say, well, is, is this about money? No, but um, we live in a world that requires a certain base of, to a certain institutional base in order to do what we do as Episcopalians. And we've managed to do this um, as a partnership. We've managed to do what no other two dioceses in the Episcopal Church have managed to do. Just because we want it, because we said, we'll do it. Not because somebody said, you have to. Not because we were, we were all on our knees and, and had no other choice. Because we chose it. That's an adaptive intervention. And so I just want to say, we know how to do this and encourage us to take the steps we need to take as we go forward. Well, I think I've, I've given you uh, a taste of this, at least uh, of some of, of my thinking about it. I believe that, that God is in the, in, in the process of transforming all things. 
and that we become more and more uh, adjusted to a new reality, that it's God's reality every day that we can decide to live into it, that God wants for us infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. And if we'll decide to walk out of the village and ask Jesus to touch us one or more times with, with his healing touch, that we will be able to transform the world around us. And I'm counting on that. And uh, God is counting on us. So as scary as that might be, we're it, folks. We're what, we're what God has put here for this time. And I'm going to assume that God knows, uh, God knows. God knows us and our gifts. And uh, we're not going back to the village, Tom, Broad, thank you. Um, we're not going back to the village. We're going we're gonna to keep going. And people might still look like trees and things might still be unclear to us. But here we go. We're on our way. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. I appreciate your time, your patience. And I misspoke. Kathleen Moore is not presenting next week. Uh, you, you would think that, that I'd have the schedule in my mind, but the uh, Twyla Smith and Tamara Plummer are gonna be with us next week. And I hope that you can, you can come, and Tamara's from Episcopal Relief and Development. Twyla's one of our own. And uh, we're hoping that you can come and join us to learn more about how we use resources. The link to the schedule of upcoming workshops is in the chat. If you wanna click on that and uh, we'll be glad to have you join us. And I wanna say thanks for being here and blessings on your night. Blessings to you all and go in peace.